Hello. Welcome to Jumpstart. Uh, as you know, we've got um, four amazing speakers. One of them is so amazing, I asked them to come twice. Um, and we've got a new speaker each day. And I want to tell you a little bit about this uh, group as a whole, and then we will talk about Dave. Um, so Martha and I have been part of this uh, digital pedagogy um, community for a lot of years. Um, I would, I would put Martha as, you know, one of the founding members of the DigPed community. Um, and uh, these are folks who, in general, have been interested in the uses of technology and new media in teaching, but particularly in both critical and human-oriented ways. So these are people who use a lot of technology, but do it um, with a lot of um, caution and also with a lot of questions about what technology does to, for, and with human beings. So the people that we've invited, I think, lean towards uh, online course design in many ways. Um, they're people who've taught lots of courses online um, and people who have founded uh, lots of new ways of doing online learning. Um, but there are also people who, like the ACE framework, have really centered uh, human connection in the online environments that they design. So some of the folks we've invited are here to talk about really specific things. For example, Jordan is going to be talking about um, assignments and assessments in particular. Uh, Jordan works um, both at Muhlenberg and with VLAX, and these are two really different kinds of design environments. VLAX is very much centered on, um, it's a K-12 charter school that uses Moodle to basically build all its courses in a very um, sort of predictable and clear way. And then Muhlenberg, which has done some really, really innovative things with things like domain of one's own and uh, working on the open web. So she's got really great ideas about um, assignments and assessments that draw from those particular areas. Uh, Bonnie Stewart is, um, I would say, probably one of the biggest uh, folks in the world working on uh, building connection in online environments. That's really where she thrives. Um, how do people build relationships online? And that's what she's going to uh, talk particularly about. Um, Dave, who happens, uh, interestingly, to live in Bonnie's house. Um, I assume it is Bonnie's house, Dave. Is that right? I don't know. He looks skeptical. Um, of Definitely course, Bonnie's yes. house. Are you kidding? Yeah. Did you not see her picture show up whenever I signed That's into right. my own account? He lives in Bonnie's Zoom, actually. I do. Um, I do. And, it's a true story. Uh, Dave Cormier is uh, a wonderful guy. And the, the two things I want to um, say about Dave, and you can read his, his bio on the site, but um, first of all, he, uh, the legend goes that the word MOOC was coined by Dave and his friends in Dave's living room. So when you think of these massively open online courses or designing really open architecture online courses, um, Dave is, you know, pretty much uh, the 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 genesis. So that to me, uh, that's like a, uh, that's a, a pretty big claim to fame. Um, the other thing that really changed my life when I learned about it um, and, and listened to Dave talking about it on one of his videos um, is rhizomatic learning. Um, and those of you who are environmental scientists and biologists will know about rhizomes, these sort of tangled clumps of roots. Please don't make me define it biologically. I don't really know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but he talks about learning um, as opposed to something that has a beginning, a middle and an end. Um, thinking about it um, in a more tangled and uh, as a as more of as a series of connections. Um, and he's really done some beautiful things about course design, which we are used to thinking about in very, very linear ways, um, in ways uh, that unsettle that a little bit. Um, I have asked him today to talk just about his approach to design. When he sits down to think about designing a course, particularly during COVID, particularly when lots of people are online, particularly lots of people who are online 
who haven't taught online much before. So uh, that's Dave. Um, I think we will enjoy him. He's going to present his stuff. And um, actually, Dave, we're going to make you a co-host here. And then uh, there'll be some time for, for questions and debriefing when Dave is finished. So off you, Mr. Cormier. Thank you very much. Um, uh... We're not going to talk a whole lot about rhizomes today. I may throw it in here and there, but uh, it's been some kind of a year, uh, really. And it's interesting listening to you guys talk because it sounds like we're all having the same kind of year. Um, I spent a lot of time this year thinking about, you know, what that design process really is. So I, I've done a lot of that sort of work that Robin was talking about where I'm doing sort of the creative uh, giant MOOC courses or doing these kind of different weird things where I'm just responsible for me and where I'm only uh, where I'm doing courses and there's an expectation that what I'm going to be doing is a little bit different but there's an awful lot of us who are not really in that situation and often like when I teach academic writing which is one of those things I love to teach and get a chance to do I'm not really in that situation there are structures you need to follow um, and I've spent a lot of time talking to hundreds of faculty in the last year and faculty who are fantastic faculty, but never really wanted to get involved in this online business, right? Some of them that were just thinking that maybe, you know what, if I stick this out another five or 10 years, I can slip past this whole internet thing and I can just get out of this. But people who are dedicated and committed to the process and are coming in, I won't say sheepishly, but kind of, oh, I got to get this done. I care too much about my glasses. And I've sort of, you know, I've always described myself as an online learner. Now I'm kind of feeling like a learning counselor where I'm sitting down with people and going, look, I know you care, but we need to make this make sense. Like we need to make this so that it works. And the word that I've come down to in, the, in this in the last year, and it's a word that I've never really used in design before, but I'm gonna introduce it with you guys here today. Uh, and that's trust. Designing for the trust process as the core message that I've got in my head. And at the end of the day, it's kind of where uh, Liz, I'm glad that I am describing you because you are not alone. Uh, and, and so many passionate educators who are now coming in uh, to the place that, uh, you know, as uh, Robin was saying earlier, Martha invented 15 years ago. Um, right. Okay. So when we design, we're designing for a context, no matter what we're designing, we're always trying to imagine the thing we want to get done. Right. And we have to understand the context that we're in and design for it. And there's two pieces I need to set up here in terms of the way that I look at um, at the world in which we teach just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So that's the, the knowledge context as it's changed and the, the context for our audience. So our information context has changed. I mean, it's changed in so many ways. The, you know, the idea that we can reach out and get the lyrics to uh, excuse me, I kissed this guy uh, was the way that I actually literally was one of those people who thought that it was that the Jimi Hendrix lyrics were that, right? The idea that we can reach out and find that information, the idea that we can reach out across the world and meet people, the idea that I can just zoom into your conversation right now, like our, our context has changed. We communicate with each other differently. Um, we've reached this point where we've moved from knowledge scarcity to knowledge abundance. And that's really the key transition in our context. For uh, four or 5,000 years, our schools were built to solve the problem of information scarcity. I can't get access to that information. Please come to my school and I will give you that information, right? We collect it all together in little packages and put them inside of rooms that have like books in them and we bring people together. And it's a totally great idea and I'm so glad we did it but it's just not where we are anymore. And I'm not suggesting this is a good thing. It's not a challenge, it's not an opportunity. It's literally where we are. And there's nothing we can do about that. And it's not COVID that's done this to us, but we've all gotten to the point, I think, where we're forced to confront it, right? That our, our relationship to information is just not what it was even 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, right? I'm not saying that this is something where y'all have been missing out on a bucket. The last five years, even, I would say that transition has been um, has made it everywhere. We certainly see it in our elections. We can certainly see it in um, marketing, all this stuff. Like we just have a different relationship. And our schools are built for artificial scarcity, right? We have this idea that when somebody comes into our classroom, if they're going to take a test 
or we're going to do an assignment well we block them off we create this sort of zone of artificial scarcity that they live inside of where we can control what's going on. We can control their access to information. We can control whether or not they're talking to each other. We can control whether or not they're grabbing bits of information in different places. Um, but once a thing is no longer scarce, we can no longer control it, right? And that's kind of the shift that's happened. That control has gone away. We're no longer able to hold that information down. And all of our experiences in education are built on that idea of control where we control the information the students have access to, and we get to choose, <laughs> that's funny, we get to choose um, what information our students are gonna reach, and we get to control that experience, right? But our students have access to all that information. They can reach out at any time and find whatever they wanna do, and we call that cheating, right? We call that access, we call that connection, we call that something, that is troubling. And I'm not suggesting that every one of you in the classroom feels this way. What I'm suggesting is that in the 200 conversations I've had in the last nine months, 187 of them have included this conversation, have included this sort of central disconnect that happens when people move online, that suddenly they're not in control of the conversation and the students are scattering out and doing stuff that, like the number of faculty I've spoken to who feel betrayed, who feel like they're challenged in a way that, you know, they're, they're worried they're gonna be sending out students who are not prepared, who are not, um, you know, I saw it this morning. So it's like, well, they're not gonna be prepared for doing the nursing tests because there's cheating on the tests beforehand. So when they get to accreditation, they're not gonna be ready, right? That worry, that professional concern has been at the core of so many of those conversations. And I think a, a quick conversation about that student context helps us understand that's the knowledge context, but that student context help us understand where those students are and help us understand how to design for trust inside of it. This is, a, I, I don't have the student's name up there, but uh, one of the dozens of quotes I've got from students about this issue, you know, at any given time, if you give a student any published question, if you give them a question you had last year, if you give them an exam, if you, at any time you give them something that has been published anywhere, the answers to the question are literally sitting there on their desk. It's like walking past a teenager, putting candy on the desk and going, don't eat it every day, right? That access is immediate and it's all the time. It is totally different than the situation that we are in. And I think we just, we need to understand where those kids are at so that we build from a position of trust. It's giving someone a constant access to temptation and telling them not to doesn't create a trust relationship, right? And I understand this is a difficult conversation for a lot of people. I've had a lot of people get angry with me on Twitter in the last couple of weeks around this conversation. Uh, half of Australia seemed to be yelling at me a couple of weeks ago uh, because it is a big issue and people get really passionate about it. And I'm glad they do because it means they care about the education process, but it's just things have changed, right? This is one of my favorite, um, it is a template for writing answers to questions inside of a Coke label. So you can wrap it around the Coke bottle because in my day you had to actually take the label off and write inside of it. Um, but now you can actually just pre-print it and get all of your answers on there. Uh, I too, uh, like Robin, am not sciencey enough to know if this is accurate stuff, uh, but I'm just gonna assume that somebody out there is going, yeah, that's right, and then we'll move along. So at the, at the start of it, the connection is something we just need to take into account in our design. Uh, it could be a great, it could be a great assignment. Um, they, every, almost every, not all students necessarily, but almost every student is constantly connected to their study group. And this is one of the things that I found that's been the most interesting in the last little while is that the students are always sort of almost semi-connected the whole time they're working. So this is uh, Discord. It's one of the ways the cool kids are connecting with each other. Um, but they have a chat room open with their group, their study group. So they're constantly working back and forth. That collaboration is built in, right? You're, the, the idea of a student at home doing their work alone is very much the exception and not the rule. Certainly there are kids who prefer to work by themselves, but the vast majority of them, at least to some degree, have some degree of connection. My favorite story from a student on this one was three hours before my exam, he's telling me, and he goes, yeah, I just, I wasn't ready. So I went for lunch because I didn't know what else to do. And I got back after lunch. I'm like, oh my God, I only got two hours before my exam. What am I going to do? 
And so he tells his brother and his brother goes, I'm not helping you with your exam. What do you want me to do? Do it, do, do your work. And he goes, well, I have a buddy and his buddy works at the car dealership. This is automotive mechanics guy at the car dealership calls another guy. They message back the exam from two years ago. This is in like four minutes, the exam from two years ago. And then another friend comes in and teaches him from the exam. And then he goes and does the exam and gets a 99 because the exam was exactly the same. That communication structure is just built into the process, right? And we need to understand that in terms of when we're talking about our design. And of course, there are all these systems out there that collect this information. So this is from Chegg, but there are lots of others. Um, these are repositories the students have to pay for to get in, but there's answers. There are, then there's paid tutorials in there as well. There are people, I talked to one kid who said that uh, his tutor would not give him the answers and forced him to study properly inside of Chegg. So it's not a universally cheating system, but it's access to all of the information that you ever gave out ever. Because the students basically always have the teacher's copy. And that just has to be at the start of your design process now. They are holding the teacher's copy in their hand. I mean, as a kid, I can still remember looking at the teacher's copy on the teacher's desk, like in grade eight. And like it's a teacher's copy on top. And you knew that the back page had all the answers to all the questions. That's just where they're starting. More challenging even, this is a Times Higher Ed article, um, there's contract cheating. And if it's a term you've not uh, seen before, you probably understand it. It is people who pay people to do your assignments. Um, anytime you see an assignment that simply looks too good, um, there's a 5% chance that those students have actually paid somebody and literally they give them, they give the company your question and then this, the company guarantees the grade and guarantees that it will not be picked up by one of these systems. Um, so if you're doing a term paper that has no check-ins over the term, you're going to run into this challenge at this point. And there are laws in, I think it's three different countries now who have tried to legislate this away. You can try. Um, but the companies, as they legislate against them, they shift slightly and then the kids can find them again. And the reason your materials are getting put into these sites and the reason this is happening, and this is something else that um, I know a lot of faculty at, at my university are really frustrated as they find their materials magically showing up online, is that students get rewarded for putting materials online, they get free tutoring and they get access to more information from that. So we've always had this two tiered system in higher ed, it's not one we talk about a lot, but if you come from a family with a lot of money, you can afford tutors who can help you through school and allow you to do better. Um, well, this is the solution for those kids who don't can't afford to pay for the sites that give them access to this stuff. And I've heard uh, my probably my favorite comment from a student was the only reason I don't cheat is because I don't care about what grade I'm going to get. And the follow up from that from another student was, yeah, well, obviously, if you're not cheating, you're not going to get the best grades in the class. It is endemic in the process, right? The access is simply there. So how do we design for it, right? How do we design for trust with all this abundance? Put aside the word cheating, take it as abundance. They have access to an amazing amount of information, right? And it is exactly the same experience they're gonna have when they work, when they move to the workforce, right? It's exactly the same experience they're gonna have. They're gonna have all of this abundance and the challenge they're gonna have is, what do I do about it, right? So. The response from a lot of people, and this is my uh, Ian Link letter um, uh, posting, I need to make this comment all the time. One solution is to lock it down. People are cheating. I'm going to stop them from cheating. I'm going to use a piece of software that does it. Uh, this is a slide uh, used by um, that was made by Ian Link letter at the University of British Columbia in Canada who's currently being sued by this company. Um, and if you look at the way this software works, every student starts out with a suspicion level. Even if you're a student who is a good student, you are still partially suspicious, right? This is the opposite of trust. Whenever it is so gross, I couldn't agree with you more. It's the opposite of trust. And anytime we're doing surveillance instead of trust, we're not dealing with the issue. We're not accepting the situation that we're in, right? And the software doesn't even work. Um, right, and that's that's the bad part of this is that as a faculty member to use the software effectively, you still need to go back and rewatch all of the videos anyway. Um, so even if the idea appeals to you, it is neither ethical nor effective. 
Uh, not in all cases. I mean, there are places where you could do it, I suppose so. But generally speaking, the software, from my perspective, is not the solution. And it's a war we're not going to win. And that, at the end of the day, I have one faculty member I'm working with who probably spends 10 hours a week working on academic integrity issues, where she is tracking down people and trying to find them at the end of the day and literally stalking them on Chegg, trying to make sure that students aren't cheating. And I asked her this week, whether or not she'd rather spend more time with the best students in her class trying to help them love the work that they're doing. And she's like, yeah, I'd love that. I'm like, well, then why don't you do it, right? Why don't we turn this around and start asking ourselves whether or not this is effective? I'm gonna skip this for time. Um, because for me, designing for care is the same thing as designing for trust, right? What we're trying to do here is build a relationship with our students, right? We're trying to have them get to the point where they're actually interested in being part of a field, right? We're actually, I mean, ostensibly, if we're teaching something, hopefully, we're the sort of people who are actually, who actually care about the stuff we're teaching about, right? We're actually involved in that process and want to encourage people to come into that. So another comment from a faculty member that I had the other day was, well, those three, those three sections in the middle of this are always boring, so we just have to suffer through it, right? If that's the perspective we take, it's no surprise that students treat our design in a transactional way, right? In that transactional attitude, that idea that I give you something and you give it back to me, that trick, that idea that I have the knowledge, but I'm going to withhold it from you and I'm going to ask you if you know it and test against this thing that I'm holding here is very much a scarcity model. And I'm not suggesting that there aren't ways in which students remembering things is relevant. I'm perfectly happy that I can do my times tables. Um, and I think that having some basis of understanding of how other people use language, for instance, is useful. But, and uh, as we're saying in the chat room here, there are standards tests that need to apply. There are places we need to get to in sort of in inside of our growth as learners that run into tests. So I, I managed a medical school last year. And one of the conversations that we have all the time when I have this conversation is, well, we don't want a doctor to learn in this kind of random way. They need to know what to know and they need to know answers to those questions. And it's always the doctor thing that comes up. And I talked to a lot of doctors last year um, about their teaching and about their practice. And it's funny because they, their lives have totally changed in the last 20 years. It used to be that when you went into the emergency room, <laughs> when you went into the emergency room, um, you went in and explained what your problem was to a doctor and the doctor gave you a diagnosis. Now, the doctors I was talking to um, will tell you that patients come in to the emergency room telling the doctor what tests they want because they know what their problem is, right? If you walk into a doctor's office and that doctor checks their phone, the first response you get from a lot of patients apparently is, well, why don't you know the answer? Why are you looking at your phone? And at the same time, if you ask that same patient, do you want your doctor to live by the information they learned in medical school 30 years ago? The answer is going to be, well, no, lots of things have changed since then. We have this disconnect between what we think people need to learn and how we go about doing it. We all know that that information has increased. We all know that the knowledge has increased. We all know that this landscape is different. And yet we're still trying to perform from these positions of scarcity. And the first solution to that is that, that's very funny, um, is that we need to have this piece of self-reflection, right? And it's probably the hardest part of the design process, right? So there are so many things we carry over from the way we were taught um, from the things that are easy to get done, from the things we tried last time, the things we tried 10 years ago, there's this carryover that happens. And it's a totally natural process. I mean, we've learned, we've experienced, we have new ways of getting stuff done. We have old ways that, are, that have been effective of getting stuff done. But the first part of this is to sort of sit down and do that piece of self-reflection and ask yourself at every step, am I doing this because it builds trust? Because it's going to help those students start to understand my field, the things I think are important, the key things that I think are important, or is it because 
there's an expectation I'm going to do this? Is it because I did this last time? Is it because, uh, and actually one of the things I've, I've found run into the most is people who think they're supposed to teach in a certain way. Like there's a set of rules out there somewhere that as long as they follow them, it'll be okay, right? That somehow there's a rigor to teaching in this way that um, means that they're doing their job properly. So there's sort of four messages that I have in terms of designing for trust that I think um, can be helpful. And I just, when I say care, um, it's one of those words that some people it resonates with them really deeply and other people they go, what are you even talking about? We're a university. Let's let kids need to come in here and get their work done. What I mean by care in this case can be something that you can interpret for yourself. There's no need <laughs> in our rhizomatic way. There's no need for this to be one way of looking at it. But at the end of the day, we need to care about the work we're doing. And if that care is a deeply emotional care, then I would suggest that that's probably a great thing. But at the end of the day, caring about the work and doing it for a reason is enough in this. Whichever kind of care works for you. That care and design, uh, Bonnie Stewart, who is going to be talking to you on uh, Thursday, and I have been talking about this sort of simple model, and this may come up again on Thursday, but I don't think it coming up twice is a bad thing. So I try to get people to think in terms of the work they're doing being simple, equitable, and engaging. Now, when I say simple, I don't mean easy. What I mean is focus in on the things that people actually need to learn, right? So uh, great conversation with a faculty member uh, a couple of months ago. She goes, huh, I've been designing all of my courses to be two hours, all my classes to be two hours long. When I go back and look at those lectures, I ask myself, how much of this have I just padded? How much of this have I just shoved in because it's two hours? Like, I mean, it's an arbitrary number. We do that face to face because we have to gather people into a room. And so it's kind of hard to, I mean, it'd be inefficient to gather people into a room and have a seven minute conversation with them, right? So we go for two hours, but it's a tendency that we have to stretch all that stuff out to make it fit there. So when I say simple, I'm thinking of um, one of our environmental uh, engineering profs who said, oh my God, I have been covering content in my course for 15 years. Why am I telling them all these things? I know they don't, they can't possibly understand all of this in one term. What if I just focused on the one thing I really, really cared about and did it over and over again till they really deeply understood it, right? And that's what I mean by simple, right? Really focusing in. And then the trust just follows, right? If you're just covering a whole bunch of things one after another, you're not creating a relationship between you, between the material and the students. If you're really focusing on something that you're deeply passionate about, one, cheating is gonna be super, super hard, um, but it's also an authentic experience, right? Of that relationship to coming to know. Equitableness, I mean, that's, and I, I know Robin and Martha are covering this all the time. I mean, the way we have to understand that those students, and Robin said it earlier, that student who for whatever reason is not comfortable coming into your class face to face, there are a thousand reasons for that. And they're all things that we need to allow for, right? And the last piece engaging, this is gonna be a, sort of a repeated comment through a variety of pieces. Um, our classes have to be interesting. Like at some point they actually, I know it's, it's it maybe weird to say, and I'm sure lots of you are like totally like, but if they're not interesting, what are we doing? Right? What are we doing in this process? And how, and again, if I come in and I'm not interested in my material, why would I expect a student to be interested in the response? Right? You have to build that engagement into the process. Um, I think a big piece of this is about the discussion, is about the digging in. So I have uh, one uh, faculty member who was saying um, every one of the first comments in a discussion forum that I'm getting this term are probably stolen from the internet. Wow. So why don't you grade the response? She said, what do you mean? I'm like, just tell them they can cheat for the first answer. Well, then they're going out and finding the information on the internet. I'm like, yeah, that's a good skill. Get them to go find the information on the internet and then only worry about the conversation that comes after that. Focus on that part of the process, focus on the engagement, focus on that voice that they're developing as a professional, 
When we look at an expert, I don't check to see what your degree is. I want to know whether or not you can engage appropriately, right? So uh, when Martha and um, Robin and I were having a meeting when this, we were talking about this a month ago, just listening to them, I'm thinking, wow, they're so smart, right? They have that, that note of expertise. They're not showing off about it, but they just have it, right? That, that voice, that sound in our field that I recognize as expertise. And that's really what we're looking to develop. That is, in a sense, the content that we're looking for, is that ability to engage inside of a field. Um, this is a straw poll I took on Twitter uh, a couple of weeks ago that I love. When synchronously teaching, what's the maximum amount of time you should be taking without some kind of student interaction? And I'm breaking that rule right now. Um, but that is because uh, this talk, when I looked at it this morning, was going to be about two hours long. And I'm shoving it into a uh, tiny ball, just trying to make sure I hit the time, uh, which is all stuff you shouldn't do. So here I am talking about stuff and I'm doing the exact opposite. So that chunking that we were talking about earlier in terms, oh, look at you, Martha. Um, that chunking we were talking about earlier where, you know, that professor was like, I've got seven minutes that are really important. That seven minutes, I, I think a seven minutes is a magical number anyway focusing on those pieces that are really important and then having them engage in the process, constantly returning back to them. The idea that we weekly sit around with people three times a week and have them be quiet and have us talk to them. If you're going to come together, there has to be some sense of eventedness to that. There has to be a reason, there has to be good faith for those students to come, right? And again, that's how the trust gets built. So, Show care in your expectations. This is um, a little bit of sacrilege coming here um, from a design perspective, but it's one that I found really useful this term. So we have this, we have course hours or credit hours, depending on where you are. Uh, I actually normally cite the American government's rules around this. So this will be more applicable to this situation than it normally is in my Canadian context. Um, according to the US government for every hour inside of class, you spend two to three hours outside of class. I mean, you can call it Carnegie unit. There are all kinds of reasons, but basically our, our higher education is shaped around this idea that we have 15 hours of class and we have 30 hours outside of class. And like in Canada, universities are 15 hours and, and community colleges are 45 hours, but the expectation is students are doing the same amount of work that a university student has a bunch of um, unconnected pieces that they're doing on their own time to develop it out. So, right? so we have this amount of hours that we have that we expect students to work. Carnegie Unit is not a government thing, but the US government on its website has a whole section where it talks about how much work um, is required for it to be an official university courses. And it says two to three hours outside of class. I can find that I have the citation somewhere. Uh, two to three hours outside of class for every hour inside of class, uh, according to the Department of Education. But the Carnegie unit, oh, I shouldn't start. <laughs> Don't get me talking about the history of education. Um, originally, it was for high schools, 120 hours per course. Um, but it's been sort of, at least I see it as the foundational piece of this one hour in, three hours out. Um, So the way that I have been trying to get faculty to see it is from a total work hours perspective, because we don't have to be face to face, because we don't have to be teaching two hour lectures, frankly, when we are face to face, we don't need to be having two hour lectures, because we're not strong, we're not required to teach in this way, because we have all these other ways of connecting, right, what I'm asking faculty to do is think about the amount of work you want a student to do. What is the total number of things you want them to do? And then to work back from there. That's, it's the one constant that we have in our education system. So traditionally we start with learning objectives or goals. I always say first, let me just, let's just talk about how much work you want the students to do, right? And what you want that work to look like. So I start from that question and I've gotten everything from three hours to 15 hours a week from faculty in terms of their understanding of what a rigorous amount of work looks like. And that to me is the first conversation. You start from there and then you move forward to, okay, so if you want them to spend nine hours of work a week, how much of that time do you want them passively listening to you talking? 
how much of that is valuable and how much of that is about them actually actively working and when they're actively working how much of that time do you want them to spend on things right to me <laughs> it's all bullshit we need a revolution um yes that would be great um but i don't think that's going to happen quickly until then if we could start thinking this way um, I think it would help us sort of envision that experience from a student perspective, because if there's anything that's blown up, um, certainly in Canada, if there's anything that's blown up during COVID, it's the amount of busy work that students are being asked to do, right? It's the amount of repetitive projects they're being had to do. And, and full disclosure, certainly people like me are part of that problem. So 12 months ago, when I was talking to a group of faculty, I had an expectation that two or three of them were going to go back and take my advice. In the last eight months, all of them are taking my advice. And unfortunately, when I use an example, I use one or two examples, and then all the faculty use the same example back in their class. And as a student, you end up doing the same activity in four straight classes because I talked to them. So, so that's, that's on me. <laughs> that's just bad teaching. Um, but it's also this desire to be rigorous, this desire to fill in that time. And like I've talked to students who have 35 discussion posts a week, um, 40, right? And at some point you've got to ask yourself whether or not anybody's learning anything. Because again, at some point it becomes transactional. Too much work will get to the point where they will skirt out the side, they're gonna go look for the answer. They're gonna disengage, they're going to give you the answer that you want and if you're getting 150 discussion posts a week, you're not going to read them all anyway, or you're going to drive yourself crazy, right? So reducing that workload, reducing the total work hours and focusing in on what you really care about and what they really need to learn, right? Again, it builds that trust with the student. It makes it so that they can really care about the work that they're doing for you. And that's got to be better, right? Because if we expect that work to be interesting, if we do less of it, right, and we make it more focused, more engaged, more something that um, that they can care about, right? People aren't going to cheat if they care about the work they're doing, right? Different students in same class doing too much and too little. Well, that's it. I mean, speaking about them, yeah. All of my students complained about how overwhelmed with work they were. Every single one of my students. So I have, um, I've had 44 co-op placements working for me since the start of COVID. Um, and it's the universal, I mean, these are not, these are not students who, well, why not? I don't grade them. So they have no reason to tell me that it's too much work, right? These are students who are passionate and engaged and, you know, like the student who says, I don't, cheat because I don't care about the grades. He really wants to understand the concepts. And yet he's like, there's too much work here. Like there's way more work than there was. There's way more time on task than there was before. Um, and that has changed and it's, it's only increased that lack of trust. You know, we've got five, students who are like, what are they even doing? What is happening here? Why am I being given this work, right? What's it actually going to accomplish? Oh, some really good comments going on in the chat room. Um, and for me, this is always kind of my motto for designing any of these assignments as they go in is expecting a student to work for a really long time on one piece of work, right? It works around the whole contract issue. So if a student, um, I'll give you an example. I got a philosophy prof that I've been working with who um, it teaches existentialism, which is one of those things where it takes forever, right? Kids just don't get it. They don't get it. And they start to get it. They start to get it. They start to get it. It's got that iterative process to it anyway. Um, but what he's been doing with them is just uh, having one page, one shared Word doc that they go through the whole term with. He comments on it and they comment back and he comments on it and the paper gets longer and longer and longer. And then at some point it actually gets submitted. So the assignment submissions every term, every week are working on the term paper, right? It gives you a chance to really give that formative feedback, like honest to goodness formative feedback, right? That kind of feedback where you give student feedback and then they go back and make the work better. 
right? You can grade formative feedback. And in this case, he is grading every week on their submissions, but then the feedback allows them to do better, allows them to do better and better. And by the end of it, that experience, rather than a bunch of disconnected assignments, which is what he had when we started, um, it became a conversation between him and each of his students, right? And again, it builds trust and it builds uh, an understanding, right? So maybe the hardest part of this is building that trust in your connections with students. So if you're online or you've got a student who is online when you're in class, and actually that's probably the hardest version of this. So you've got 15 students in front of you and you've got 15 students who are not. Building a connection with those students who are outside of your class um, is maybe the hardest part of this whole process. We're so much of the, 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 so many of the tools that we have for building connections are ones that uh, we built face to face, right? Um, so how do we think about that? How do we build in that connection? How do we build that into the process? The first piece that I would say is just about building presence into your design. So uh, one of the things, for instance, that I always try to do is send out my own personal response to an article with the article that I'm sending out to students. So if I have a piece that's particular, I'll be like, man, I had to read this article three times because the first time it was totally like, I didn't understand this and whatever. So when you get into this, do understand this is a difficult piece of material. You're going to have to read it at least twice to get through it. And here's a piece that might help you including your voice, regardless of how you do that, whether it's text or whatever, but including your presence in the content, right? In the things that you send out and the ways that you send out that material and the engagements you make makes a huge difference. It's the same thing you would be doing in class, but we often think of those kinds of actions as transactional. Here's the thing you need to read, right? Here's the assignment you need to have. But in class, we would actually have that bit of um, connection, right? That chance to put the human case on this, to put the professional context on it, right? Um, also, when we work online, we have a tendency to, or I shouldn't say we, I have a tendency to think about all of the students, not every student. So I always send out, um, a reminder at the start of each week, what's going to be happening. I do introductory videos. I do group responses to blog posts, but it's really easy to see a bunch of people in a course as a group, as a single group, right? As a whole. And they're not, they're individuals. And each one of them is coming at this from a different place and coming at this in a different way and finding that way to connect to every student rather than to all the students. And I know it sounds like a lot more work and frankly it is, um, but it's where the trust gets built, right? Even if you only reach out to that student individually a couple of times, that individual connection is as important to the overall, con uh, the, the overall conversation as that whole one. So I wanna ask a quick question here, uh, just before we close, a little bit of feedback. So this is the activity I do with every faculty member that I work with. So I wanna try it with you guys in the chat room. When you walk into a face-to-face -face classroom, what are the what are the, the those sort of interstitial pieces? What are those things that you do in a face-to-face -face classroom? Just sort of close your eyes for a second and think about it. When you walk into class, it's for some of you 20 minutes before class, for some of you 15 seconds before class. But when you walk into that classroom, what is the thing that you do? Just pop me into the chat room. joke around, I talk to them, Studnitz, I'm informal, I put stuff on my desk, I chat with who's there, I ask how they are, I check in with them, consistent engagement, I answer questions, yeah, all of those things. It's the smiles, it's the greeting. It's the, oh, I can see Jimmy over there. He's at class today, which is good, but doesn't look like he's ready to class today, right? It's all of those pieces. And I don't care if you're teaching. I'm, 
I, I do like in a class of 100 is probably the most I can actually see individuals in. But if I walk in teaching a class, of 100, I can see um, it takes me a little longer, like the time that I recognized the reason why the woman in the front row was looking at me weird is that she was wearing a neck cast. And the fact that I was pacing back and forth and she was doing this back and forth, it took me a little longer than it would have in a smaller class to notice. Um, but you notice people, right? You see them as humans, even just making eye contact with them is about seeing them as people. It's about building trust. It's about showing care, right? And you need to find ways to think about what's important to you, use that self-reflection to think about what's important to you inside of that face-to-face -face classroom and find ways of making that connection online, right? Find ways of building that relationship online. And some of that's gonna be, if you're doing uh, live sessions, some of that's about starting your live session five or 10 minutes early and just sitting and chit-chatting with those students who need that connection with you. Um, some of it is about those little notes that you send along with things. Some of it's about um, highlighting a student's work because they made a particular interesting leap and highlighting it to the rest of the class. Some of it's just about telling a story about how you came to understand one of the things the struggle, students are struggling with. It's about bringing your humanity into this process, right? And I think that for a lot of people this term and last term, they're struggling to just put the pieces together. Oh my God, like March, I, I will never have another month like March, I hope. Um, but that feeling of like, how do we just, how do we get through this, right? And then for those in the summer, how did I ever get scheduled to teach in the summer? Why is this happening to me, <laughs> right? And we had a little bit more lead into the fall, but there's still just a lot of people who are like, um, okay, I've got the mouse figured out. I got the, okay, that stuff is in there. I said, and, and a lot of it was just trying to figure out the process, but going into the winter, right? We have this chance to sort of sit back and go, right. I've done this before. I've got this behind me now. What I need to do is figure out how to bring me to this space. It's not that you can't. It's that it takes that sort of self-reflection. It takes time to push yourself into the space. But the students are ready for it, right? They, and I mean, this is true story. They were not ready for this either, right? The idea of a 17-year-old talking to somebody they don't know online just never happens. Um, you go online as a 17 year old to connect with the people you would have talked to face to face. This idea of being thrown into a discussion room with other 17 year olds or ever, other 18 year olds to have a conversation, terrifying. They weren't ready for this either. <laughs> um, this is not their experience of the internet either, right? But I think we can walk into this this winter and bring ourselves to the conversation, bring our humanity and create that trust that's gonna make the difference with this group with one small caveat, because the last piece here is that you need to take care of yourself. The single biggest problem, not the one I've heard people complain about, but the one that I've seen is that the best teachers are burning themselves out, right? They, in an attempt to try to do this, and this, this to me is the total caveat, bring yourself there, but you can't bring all of yourself there you can't be there all the time. You can't be answering emails at three o'clock in the morning, Robin. You can't have that all on all the time piece because for the best teachers, every time a student reach out, reaches out to them, they get back to them, right? Every time. And it used to be that that used to be contained by when you were in class or it used to be contained by because students would wait to ask you a question when they got to class. And now online, students are coming at some faculty all the time, right? Constant connection, which is not healthy for you either, right? So create some structure around that as well. Tell your students you won't answer an email after five o'clock at night. Tell them to bring most of their questions to a live session, right? Create that structure around that stuff. Because at the end of the day, you cannot pour from an empty cup. You cannot build trust and show care if you're too tired to make that happen, okay? Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dave. Um, so we have built in 15 minutes for questions with Dave, and um, we're, we're a large group, but not too large of a group, I don't think. 
Um, so I think we should, I'm gonna actually, Dave, can you stop sharing your screen? I can do that, but no. I can't get there. <laughs> um, and I'm gonna go into gallery view, which will sort of allow me to, um, to see you if you want to talk a little bit but if not can you just stop that for me because i'm on my pc right. and i always forget where the button this is here do you want to continue yes oh i had to do it this way okay hold on i don't know why it's not giving me the option i think my zoom is too small hold on oh. i'm gonna get it there you go yay okay. thank you um so uh, if you have a question, maybe you can just um, gesture in some way, either with the raise hand thing or with your actual hand, and we'll try to get people. But um, Dave has a lot of experience designing um, everything from MOOCs to regular online courses to doing curriculum design for and with other faculty. So it's a great time to get specific questions answered or just to talk about some of his stuff from his um, from his slides. So, anybody want to kick us off? Maybe use Phil raise with his hand. hand up. Okay. Phil had his hand up earlier, unless that was Phil hand clapping. Lonergan. Is that hand clapping or was that clapping? <clears throat> yeah, I it was uh, pretty interesting what you were saying about um, that the internet is out there and all information is out there that the students come in and essentially we don't need to give them information because they already have it. I know uh, my colleagues, some of my colleagues in the art department and I teach uh, sculpture, ah. there's so many videos out there and in some ways, the, the fact that they get a diversity of opinions of how to do something is so helpful that when the students, if, if, they, if we can set up that culture where they go out and do that research when they come into class, in some ways, all we're doing is just helping them solve a few minor problems. They've almost done the learning by themselves. So it's, it's kind of an interesting you know, it's made us think, what are we really doing in the classroom other than creating a culture of research, really? So it's interesting. I worked with a sculptural welder this year um, who uh, came in and was like, you're not going to tell me how I'm going to do this online because that's <laughs> not going to happen. I'm like, well, no, your big welder is not going to come to the Internet. I agree with you. Uh, but that's basically the conversation I had with them is that, you know, we have Again, we've always had this two-tiered entrance into higher ed where students who, again, with my doctors, half of the doc, half of the students were the children of doctors and they knew what was expected of them, right? And a lot of people who come into art, they're the, they're, they come from an artistic family and they have access to this huge swath of understanding, right, that they grew up in. And you have other kids who just wanna make art, but they don't have that background. And the internet is such a leveler for that. Right? It gives them access to conversations that have been privileged in the past. And it doesn't matter if it's medicine or art, just having access to that broader discussion just can be such a leveler inside the classroom. It's really exciting. It's really cool you're saying that though. The only thing I would add though, is that they're also understanding how to be an artist. And if there's anything that we have as, um, as faculty to provide is that, that context, right? And it, it's not necessarily something you have to talk about. It's not something you teach. It's something you are, right? And I think I, just the way you put that, I have a funny feeling that your students are probably getting that in class as well. Yeah, yeah, it's super interesting how the digital has changed um, all of those physical things that we've done. But there are some limitations, like you said, with, with welding, but they've even got virtual welding now. So yeah, but that touch on the welder, only one way to get that. We will not get into virtual welding. We will toss it over to uh, Siobhan and Laura and maybe <laughs> Becky after that. So Siobhan. Thanks Robin and thanks Dave. That was super interesting and motivating. Um, I guess I'd like to hear you and anybody in the group think a little bit more out loud about how to begin crafting your syllabus from the standpoint of hours needed the hours needed and the work needed. Um, 
I mean, I, I had a couple of thoughts when you were talking about that. One was that I do have this experience with students, some of them complaining. Nobody ever complains that there's not enough work, <laughs> right? But sometimes they will complain that a course has been too watered down while the vast majority are complaining that there's too much work. And part of my sense of that is that some of it's come from my desire, at least, to move away from high stakes tests and essays, you know, making up large percentages of the final grade to smaller, more low stakes assignments that keep them accountable to the reading and to each other. And I think that might be part of what they're starting to feel like, like they hate, they're starting to hate discussion yep. boards, right? They're That's right. To hate blogging. They're starting to hate responding to each other on blogging. It feels like too much. And so again, I'm thinking about, and, and then I, the other thing I've found <laughs> is that sometimes the work needed for a different type of content and a different type of unit will vary and they don't like that either, right? I mean, they want it to be consistent. They want to know that's, I don't like the Carnegie units either, right? But like, it's, it's helpful to be able to tell them like, you're looking at four hours a week in this yeah. class or eight hours a week in this class. Whereas sometimes it might be eight and sometimes it might be three and so just any any thoughts out loud from you or anybody about thinking from hours needed? So I posted the blog post in there where I sort of wrote this up a couple months ago, uh, which could be a little helpful. Um, I think the it's always important, and you know, somebody tagged it in the chat room, accountability to the reading. We do grades for, broadly speaking, for two reasons. One of them is for enforcement, and the other one is for ranking. Um, right, so 1785, Yale starts the ranking one, two, three, four process. See, I told you it gets more history in. Um, and, you know, that enforcement piece has been there the whole time. It used to be with a stick and now it's uh, with the grades, but there's not a whole lot of difference between those two things. And any time you remove a topic of enforcement for ethical reasons, you have to replace it with something, right? So um, that constant small amount of assignments is definitely the thing that's getting us into trouble, um, which is why I suggest having one long assignment that you keep returning to. So there's a sense mm -hmm. of building in that assignment, right? So that it's actually, every time you have a thing to hand in, it's like, well, I'm working towards my term paper um, or I'm working towards this project that I'm working on or I'm working towards this thing, not, oh, here's this thing I've done and it's gone. Here's this thing I've done and it's gone. With the discussion forums, uh, I'm sorry, there's a lot of pieces in there. I just wanna make sure I get to them. Um, for me, a discussion forum replaces a classroom discussion and I don't grade classroom discussions, right? I don't go around the classroom and go, oh, what you just said was dumb, minus one. Like that doesn't happen in my classrooms. And I think somehow we need to think about our discussion forums the same way. They can't be that, again, transactional task that I need to get through. They have to be that place I go to get help with something or like it has to provide value in connection or um, helping them get to someplace they're trying to get to build together towards something, like it has to have that extra piece. And I think um, thinking about it, like what happens in a classroom and trying to understand what that could look like is sort of critical to that. Um, there's oh. so many things going on here. So I'm not sure if you want to keep going, but um, there's kind of a backlog. So we've got, uh, let's do Laura and then Anne, and then maybe we can get, um, it says Taylor Fred, and talking about including students in the design process. So um, Laura, you wanna go next? Sure, I'm just, um, I'm curious if you have any thoughts and you've kind of spoken to a little bit of this already, but um, there's a lot of, a lot has been written about how to design for online classes, mm -hmm. but I think it was written at a time when a certain segment of the student population was taking online classes, which is not. Totally. You're totally right. Yep. And um, and also people might mix and match, whereas now many more of their classes are online yep. or they don't have the choice of taking online. So I'm curious if you have any thoughts about what advice to throw out or what is different about designing for online now that the types of people taking online are different and the context like being in a pandemic and all the stress and worry that that entails. Um, how that would change what we think of as like good practices or what we should be thinking about for online. I think the hardest transition, I'm going to sidestep all the hard parts of your, your question to give you an easy answer. Um, 
I had a conversation with an association of deans of arts and social sciences last week. Actually, Bonnie and I both had it. Um, and the biggest piece that came up was the need for people to talk to other faculty about what they're doing. We have no structures in place for doing this in most of higher ed, right? We have structures in place to make sure that people's exams aren't at the same time, right? That functional structure that's in the registrar's office and in my university that says, oh, you're not going to end up with Chem 101 and Bio 101 at the same time. We need to take those structures and bring them into whatever fashion we can so that we're talking to each other about it. So for instance, in UK, uh, somebody I was talking to, and I can't remember what university it was, somebody smart, um, was saying that what they had set up was just for icebreakers. It was something they were trying out. So in the department, there were a bunch of icebreakers and you could take one, but once it was taken, nobody else could have it. And it's a, it's a, it was good faith. Like, I mean, obviously it wasn't, somebody's not gonna track you down, but just that idea that somehow we're all in this together, that somehow as faculty, we can help shape the experience that students are having by working together, right? I think if there's any advice I have for people is try to find ways to do it so that that student experience can be a total one. I know I sidestepped the hard part, I apologize. Martha is so uh, honest, Anne, I saw that. <laughs> and JM? Hi. Um, I enjoyed your presentation a lot, Dave. Um, question for you. I, I want to go back to your slide where you were talking about the iterative assignments. Oh, yeah. That formative feedback. I love that idea. And I'd like a little, and I, I actually tried it a little bit. Um, I teach okay. in public speaking. So I thought, you know, we're stuck in this online environment. We're going we're gonna to write our final speech in stages. We're going to, you know, it's not going to be really graded. It's just going to be a check mark for doing it, and um, and and then I'll I'll give you feedback on your speech organization. I'll give you feedback a um, little bit at a time as you build up uh, this speech. And so my question is, I have a lot of students who just said I'm not doing it because I didn't grade it, and there was no there was no carrot or stick and. And I thought, gosh, what am I missing here? I felt like some of the students, I thought, what did I do to make them not see this as a, as a good thing to turn in? And the students that did turn it in got some, they even said, wow, that was great feedback, thanks. Now I know what to do with my speech. Um, but the other ones, yeah, didn't do it. And I, I didn't know what, I didn't know how to save them. <laughs> you know. I hear you. And I've had that experience. I know exactly how you feel about it. Um, the the only sort of advice I have for that is that students come in with the expectation that their school experience is going to be transactional. They've been taught this for 13 years before they come to your classroom, right? So our high schools are incredibly transactional, right? The whole, what I call to my kids to help them survive their trip through K-12, I call it the game of school. Because my kids are, both of their well, Bonnie and I are their parents. You can imagine how they feel about education. So they're like, well, the teacher's doing this in class. And then look, you're just playing the game of school. Figure out what you're supposed to do. Solve that problem. You get the grades you need. You'll get through it. Don't let it infect you as a person. It doesn't have to be real. You're just playing a game. You just need to win. That is how our students come to our university classrooms, having played the game of school their whole lives. There is a deconstruction part that needs to happen at the start of all of our classrooms where we go, no, 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 I'm not joking. I actually want you to learn. Like you have to actually get involved in that. And it's not gonna work all the time. You're still gonna have some students who resist. The other thing that I do whenever, uh, particularly if I'm the only person in a group doing this, because then like I was in one program once that was super, super like cutting edge and everybody kind of did it. So you could get away with more. But if you're the only person doing a thing inside of a program, you don't have that much time to be programmed at the start. So one of the sort of, sort of pieces that I end up doing is I pass fail micro assignments. So I'll just say pass, 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 fail, right? And that fail is you just didn't put any work in. And if you want to have a whole bunch of Fs and rows, up to you. But if you have an F and in, in my class, if I give you an F and you redo it and do a better job, I give you the feedback. I don't care. Um, but if you need to, to structure that, to provide a little bit of scaffolding, I'm always loath to measure someone's self-reflection, but I am more than happy to measure their effort. So if I see you mail something in, I'm like, F. 
Oh, it's about it. Did you put any effort into that? Really? Can you tell me how much time you put into that? No, really. Like, just do it. And then it's fine. Right? So I help. Those two things are the things that I use to try to deal with that. It doesn't always work. But sorry, that was too long, Robin. I apologize. Too long, Dave. Yep. Uh, no, it was fantastic. Um, and I, I'm definitely having all sorts of private chats um, with people too who have more questions and stuff. Um, but I do want to set the precedent early that we will be respectful of everybody's time um, during this week. So I'm gonna uh, first start by asking Martha to end the recording.